Hello and welcome to celloprofessor.com. I'm Jamie Feist and I teach cello at Central Michigan University. And this video is about sitting position and posture. This element of cello technique is so easy to overlook, it's really easy to gloss over, but it's really the foundation of it. If we get this wrong, we get a lot of other things wrong. If, if, we, if our posture is not balanced, then that's going to affect a lot of other aspects of technique. So it's really important that we look carefully at this and talk about it and not just gloss over it. It's really the starting point of your technique is how you sit. So let's talk first what it is not. I used the word posture, but I'm actually a little bit uncomfortable with that word. And I picked this up from an Alexander Technique person. The word posture implies something rigid in a way. It can, at least in some people's minds. And I know there are some Alexander Technique specialists, and if you haven't looked up Alexander Technique, I encourage you to do so. If you're a musician, I encourage you to grab some lessons. Um, it can be very enlightening and very beneficial to our playing. But in any event, uh, there are Alexander Technique specialists who I know avoid the word posture for this very reason in a way similar to string players avoiding words like pressure and, a prefer and preferring words like weight or preferring bow hold versus bow grip because these words conjure up ideas that we're trying to avoid. Right? In a similar way, we can avoid the word posture. And I would also suggest avoiding the word sit up straight. Right. First of all, the back is not straight. The back is curved. Thank goodness it's curved. If it weren't curved, our backs would probably all be torn up before the age of one or two. So our back is curved and it serves as a natural shock absorber and it has some spring to it. All right. So again, posture isn't something rigid. There can even be a little bit of spring that goes on even when we're sitting and playing. Okay, so it's not, it's not something rigid, it's not something straight, All right? So what are some other ways we can look at it? What I like to think of is balance and lengthening the spine. But even lengthening the spine, be careful, it's not like, oh, I'm going to stretch my spine out. That, that's not what I'm talking about either. In fact, in these Alexander Technique lessons that I've had, um, the teacher has avoided even saying the word like lengthening. It's more. It's been more indirect. It's been think of a light shining out the top of your head. All right, try that once. Just sit there and think of a light shining out from the top of your head. So you get to be a little bit hippie when you're a string player like this. So think of the light coming out from the top of your head. Okay, and imagine it coming out the other side too into the ground. Right. Okay. You may have noticed a difference, perhaps. Okay, so balance and lengthening. Let's start with balance and let's start with the chair height first. I'm 6'2". I'm used to chairs being a little bit on the short side for me. Hence, I got one of these. I've got a cushion. If you look underneath the video, I will put a link to a, um, actually, I think she's a cellist. She lives out in California and she makes her own cushions. And this doesn't happen to be one of them. This is a different one that works pretty well here at home for this chair. But I have ordered one from her and they're very uh, firm. The cushions she makes, this cushion's pretty firm too. They're nice and firm and they're wedges. These wedge cushions are really nice. They put your pelvis in a, in a, in a, very optimal position for playing the cello, I think. And it's better for your lower back. But the point is, is if you use a cushion, you want it to be firm enough to support you because if it's too squishy, it's actually going to disrupt the balance more than it's going to help. So get a nice firm cushion. Now, when I put this cushion underneath like that, my legs have a very slight downward slope to them. And that's what we want. We want to feel a little bit of our weight going into our feet. If the chair is too low, 
like this and my knees excuse me are up too high it's immediately pushing me back and i'm off balance if i am off balance i'm going to be exerting a great deal of energy just holding myself up i'm gonna and i'm going to be exhausted by the end of the rehearsal by the end of the concert just from that alone try holding yourself up for an hour and a half two and a half hours it's tiring uh, if you're shorter not as tall the problem may be that chairs tend to be too high and then your 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 knees tend to go like this that also puts you really out of balance i mean you know it's like you have to, to for me to balance like if i just try, try to simulate that i have to like lean like lean back i'm actually leaning back away from the cello that can't be a great thing cellists are so long suffering you know we put up with two really uncomfortable things we put up with CPEG sticking us in the neck and we put up with chairs that are not the right height. Why do we put ourselves through that? It's a mess. It's a circus. Let's say you're teaching and you have a student and the chair is too high and you don't have access to a lower chair. What can you do? Or let's say you're teaching a classroom full of kids and a bunch of the chairs are too high and it's not in your budget right now to get different chairs. What can you do? Well, you're in a school, you got lots of these. Books, put books under the feet. It'll raise them right up. You can't see my feet, but you can see my knees go up. Right, and the advantage here, just get some old books somewhere. Go visit the librarian, see if they have any. So you put your feet right there, and the nice thing about it is you can control where the student puts their feet. All right, at least theoretically. But it can get you through get you through a, a, a situation or a time when you just don't have the right height of chair. If your chair is too low and you're tall, this is not optimal, but let's say that you just have no choice, you're using this chair, you forgot your cushion at home or what have you. I'll sometimes just do this. I'll put my feet under so I can get my legs to go down. I know that's not optimal. We're not talking optimal right now. We're talking just getting through the situation. That's what I'll end up doing. Sometimes I'll put them on the side like this just to get my knees down. I find it less tiring. Good, so how do we find our balance point now? We have a chair that's the right height and all of that. We got the books under the feet and so on. So how do we find the, the balance point? Well, we have these two sitting bones, right? and the sitting bones are rounded thank goodness they're not rectangles or something right so they're round so just kind of feel those sitting bones you know you have one on the left you got one on the right try to go back go forward go intentionally out of balance forward go intentionally out of ba balance backwards and sideways and sideways and just rest evenly on both sitting bones so just get your upper torso balanced the next thing i like to think of is balancing the head i balance this Torso, let's balance the head now. So I just usually just kind of find the balance point. So what I like to do at this point is to take the idea from the Alexander Technique specialist. And I like to think of the light beams. So if you are sitting at a chair and you're balanced right now, just again, imagine the light beams coming out the top of your head and down to the floor. Now, there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot where, to me, it feels like my muscles can relax, actually relax. It's not something stiff because my skeletal system is supporting me. My skeletal system is bearing the weight. Yeah, there's a sweet spot where it's like almost no energy. My head is balanced and my torso is balanced. There we go. It feels really nice. It's actually quite relaxed. It's not the straight, stiff, hold yourself up sort of thing. What I'd like you to do is now that you're balanced and your head is balanced and so on, try moving your arms. Should move pretty freely. Doing forwards and backwards and so on from the shoulders. Or when I used to live in Massachusetts, they'd say shoulders. Move the shoulders. All right. Now, let's try something else. Let's slouch intentionally bring the shoulder blades forward and so oh my goodness they don't even move it's horrible it's horrible all right find your balance point again move them i mean it's totally different why would we slouch it's crazy 
Now I'd like to try something else. Stick your head forward like often happens with the C peg. Oh my goodness, even that messes up the shoulders. You see, everything's connected. Everything's connected and works together, which is why it's important. When you're balanced, your neck muscles, your back muscles, your core muscles are free to assist everything else that you're doing. And believe me, they assist. If you're off balance, they're gonna be working to hold your head up and working to hold, your core muscles are gonna hold, be working to hold you up and now you're a tight mess, right? Tight, tight core, tight neck, tight back means tight arms and tight hands. It just spreads like a disease. It's not only better for freedom of motion in the shoulders, but it's also better for avoiding impingement subacromial impingement that we cellists are very prone to that in our right arms and if you don't know what that is the impingement is there's a little gap that's between the head of the humerus this is your humerus bone here there's a head there that's under the acromion process there's a little space in there and it's crowded it reminds me a little bit of the carpal tunnel region it's crowded in here and what happens is when we have our shoulder blades forward, when we protract our shoulder blades, protract our scapulas, as they say, when we bring our shoulder blades forward, it narrows. There was a study they did, and they didn't use that many people to study this, but it seems to be pointing to this. When they took MRIs of people with this part of their body nice and open, not protracting forward, the subacromial space here, this little gap that has all kinds of stuff in there. There's bursa, tin tendons, right? That space <clears throat> remained more open than when they had the subjects protract their shoulder blades. What they did is they put sandbags under their, behind their um, scapulas, shoulder blades, and heads, so that they were protracted forward. And then they took MRIs and they measured the distance in the shoulders. And they found that when these were forward, this narrowed we don't want that as cellists it's so crowded in there we need every little millimeter we can get and and even smaller than that we want to keep it nice and open here so that we don't have problems there all right so having good posture helps that we have a artery and nerves that go under our clavicle here this part that when we go like this you can pinch it and you can slow the circulation down into the arm so there's another really good reason. It's better for the back. It's, it's, it's better for a lot of things. <laughs> so let's try to maintain our balanced posture. Now let me show you a couple uh, other aspects to this um, that I would like to talk about. And that is where to sit on the chair. Uh, cellists disagree on this, different schools of thought. I, have, I come from a particular school of thought, which is sit on the front half of the chair. I like sitting on the front half of the chair because I feel like I have more movement side to side. When I sit all the way in the back of the chair and my thighs have the chair going mostly under them, I feel very constricted. So this is somewhat of a personal preference, but I really like to teach and employ what are called bilateral and unilateral motions. Bi means two. So lateral means back and forth. So bilateral means means I go the opposite direction of my bow. Unilateral Paul Rowland, one of my favorite string pedagogues of all time, talked about the unilateral motion as being good for sustaining long bows. And he also spoke of the bilateral motion for shorter bows. So when you're balanced, your body will have more reactions to motions in the arm. Like when I'm balanced, yet stable, because my feet are flat on the floor and I just kind of move my arm back and forth and don't tighten up my body, it's going to react. It's going to move, move and react to my arms. 
and other motions like this way even uh, shift and so on so you might notice someone who's who's well balanced when they play whether it's a violinist or a cellist or a bass player that they have these reactions it's one of newton's laws every action produces an equal and opposite reaction you can see that in a balanced posture posture and i also wanted to point out something else because this is very pertinent to the discussion and that is the c peg and the g peg look what i got there i've got little baby c peg and g peg right cellists are so long suffering they put up with chairs that aren't the right heights. And if this isn't the ultimate proof of the long-suffering nature of the cellist, I don't know what it is. What is? The C peg. The, the C peg doesn't get in the way of everybody. People who have shorter torsos, right? when they put their cello here, this is further back and more out of the way. Longer torso players just have a problem with the C peg. But you know what? The C peg... The C peg is evil, okay? The C peg is evil, and it's sidekick. The G peg, yeah, just about as evil. C peg and G peg, they're like a pair to ruin your posture. Posture. <laughs> so this is what I did, this is my solution. I cut them off, and there you go. It's out of my way. You can also get posture pegs, which are basically just very short pegs and you have a key that sticks in it that has a, a head that looks a lot like a regular peg and, and you turn it and then you just put it back wherever you keep it. But I knew that wouldn't be good for me because I know I'm going to be on stage and I'm going to forget the key just at the moment my C peg, peg decides to slip or my G peg in concert. I know that's what's going to happen because it's Murphy's Law. So this is better for my personality. It's always here. The peg is still there. I can still tune with it. It's a little bit harder because the head of the peg is smaller. But boy, I really prefer it. So there you go. You can take a screenshot and take it to your luthier and tell them, take care of the evil and C and G pegs once and for all. Your long-suffering nature as a cellist has come to an end. Good. All right, and, and just one last little tidbit of info that's related to this and I wasn't sure where to stick it in the talk and that is what if you want to look down let's say you gotta find this note way down here all right you just have to know that you know if you take your hands bring your fingers up follow your jawline and just kind of keep going there that's about where your spine meets your skull it's right in there there's the there's the rotation so if you want to look down instead of doing this it's much preferable to go just go use your eyes and just tilt from right in there and look down and you still can maintain your posture and a lengthened spine and, and balance doing that okay that's all I got right now that's it that's all I got so hopefully those were good ideas spend some time get the get the chair right and, and do if this CPEG has been bothering you just take care of it once and for all. Just do it this week. Call tomorrow. Call today. Call the luthier and just get it done. Get yourself a cushion. Do something about the chair heights. You know, because we want to be comfortable. The instrument's hard enough as it is. Okay, I will see you next time and happy practicing. <laughs>